Hello, everybody. Welcome to SunFest. Uh, thank you for being here. If you can take your seats, we'll go ahead and get started. I am Jesse Paul, a political reporter here at the Colorado Sun. And uh, thank you for attending SunFest. Thank you for coming to this panel in particular. And uh, thank you to the University of Denver for generously hosting us, the great partners for us. I think maybe some of you have been to some of our events that we've had in this very room. Uh, we're so appreciative of their support. So while the program uh, might suggest that we're going to be talking about multiple ballot measures today, we're actually going to be talking about one, which is Proposition 131. And that is the one that uh, a lot of folks are talking about. It's the one I'm probably spending the most time thinking about of the 14 statewide ballot measures on the November ballot this year. Um, and so a brief explanation of what it is for those of you who might not know, uh, on the November statewide ballot, it was a statutory measure uh, placed on the ballot through the citizen initiative process. It passed. It would change most of the state's primary processes. So candidates from all parties are running against each other. So think every Democrat, Republican, and third party candidate vying for an office on the same ballot, and then the top four vote getters advance to a ranked choice voting general election. Um, it doesn't affect all races in Colorado, but a lot of them. Um, and we'll probably talk a little bit about that today as well. So, um, oh, I have a, I'll show you real fast in case you don't know what ranked choice voting is. Thank you to Amber for showing us if I can get this to work. Maybe I can't. Um, we'll get it to work at some point. <laughs> but, so ranked choice voting, essentially you'll, you'll, what it would look like and what the ballot, uh, sample ballot would look like is you know, you'd have four uh, candidates and you get to choose them in order of one, two, three, four. It'll say, you know, don't choose uh, two rankings for one candidate. Um, and uh, it doesn't, I, I don't know if it will explain the process on there, but we'll, we'll talk about it more. Um, so I'll, I'll like to introduce our panelists just as we get going. So, um, to my left, uh, Mr. Kent Theory, former CEO of the Denver-based dialysis giant DeVita. Uh, he's a big donor to Let Colorado Vote, the issue committee that's supporting this measure. He's also co-chair of the board overseeing Unite America, an election reform nonprofit that's been involved in, in this process and this election reform and, and similar ones across the country. Um, Amber McReynolds, an elections expert and consultant who is a member of the U.S. Postal Service Board of Governors. She's the former director of the Denver Elections Division. Um, then we've got Shad Marib. You guys all sat in the almost perfect order that I wrote this out, so thank you. Uh, Shad Marib, chairman of the Colorado Democratic Party. Uh, Martha Tierney, a Colorado elections attorney who works for the Colorado Democratic Party and Democratic candidates and causes. Um, then we have Matt Crane, who leads the Colorado Clerks Association. He's a Republican who was formerly the clerk in Arapahoe County. And then last but not least, Molly Fitzpatrick, the elected clerk in Boulder County. She's a Democrat. Um, a few disclosures at the top, just because we like to be transparent here at the Colorado Sun. The Theory O'Leary Foundation, which is run by uh, Mr. Theory and his wife, Denise, has been a financial supporter of the Colorado Sun in the past, but donors have no influence over editorial decisions, and they certainly have no influence over this panel today. Um, I'll also mention that Amber McReynolds is a consultant for uh, Colorado Voters First, the issue committee backing this measure, um, and then Martha Tierney has also worked for Voters' Rights Colorado at some point, right? Or was it a different name at some before it was what it is? <laughs> okay, it is a right, yeah, yeah. Um, the coalition of groups that, that's opposing the measure. Right, right, okay. Well, thank you, uh, panelists. We'll jump into the discussion. Do you guys, everybody has, we have microphones, I guess, for each pair. Um, if you could flip the thing up. I, I think you guys, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Mr. Theory, I think I, I wanna start up with a question for you to kind of shape this conversation. I, a lot of people, it's, it's a question that's on a lot of people's minds. So some folks will say that the only reason you're backing this is because you wanna run for governor someday, you wanna run for um, some elected office, and I wonder if you can just maybe put on the record, do you plan to run for governor or, or, or any other elected office, and does Proposition 131 have anything to do with those ambitions? If it's an easy one, yeah. If it's an easy one. Easy. Okay, let's turn this off. And if you guys see, there's like a little button there if you switch it up. There you go. Hello, hello, okay. All right, it's an easy one because the answer is just no. I, I'm not going to run for governor. I do not want to run for governor. I have no plan for running for office. Uh, I plan on spending this chapter of my life working on three things, democracy like this, uh, the environment, and uh, e equitable education for low-income kids. That's my, that's my plan in the coming years. And when we ran the initiatives in 16, people said I was going to use it as a platform to run for governor. Didn't. 
2018 with running the gerrymandering reform, people said you're going to run for governor, didn't. 2020 and dealing with Gallagher, people said I was doing it for that. So at some point, I think the credibility might sink in. All right. um, and we're going to jump around here. So this isn't so much of a debate as a discussion, but if somebody has like a retort, raise your hand and I'm happy to uh, give you some, some time. So Shad, I want to turn to you. You've talked about your opposition to this measure in terms of ideological stagnation. You and I had a good conversation about that. But I guess isn't part of this trying to prevent people who have limited support from being elected to office? And I wonder how you can kind of respond to what the proponents say on that front. Sure. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thanks so much to folks being here and to the Colorado Sun. You know, I think when we're talking about candidates, when we're talking about our politics, we can all agree on one thing for sure, everyone on this panel and most of you in this room, that our politics has gotten too divisive and partisanship is absolutely out of control. But an overcomplicated system that will cost tens of millions of dollars to implement, that will have confusing ballots for voters and will invite more and more dark money into Colorado politics is not the answer. And so this measure will make every problem we have in Colorado politics worse. And when you're talking about candidate recruitment, I think you only have to look at Alaska, which has implemented a model of the system where you've seen fewer candidates run for office. In fact, 30% of the races in Alaska on the general ballot this year have a single party general election. And only 5% of races have actually fielded a full slate of candidates. And so this is a system that results in not only less choice, but single party general elections, which I think Coloradans right now, over 93% of our legislative seats are contested. You have a Democrat voting against a Republican. You have unaffiliated who can petition on. The system would end that. And all we have to do is to look at Alaska to see the abysmal failure of the system there. Can you elaborate a little bit on like the accusation that more dark money would flow into these? I, I don't quite understand where you're coming from with that, since we see a ton of dark money. I, I see Sandra Fish out there somewhere. We both know there's a lot of dark money that flows into Colorado elections. So why do you think this would increase it? Yeah, I mean, again, all you have to do is look at Alaska. It 10x the amount of dark money flooding their elections because they're able to gamify ballot access. When you have guaranteed four spots for ballot access, you're seeing special interests make sure that they can buy their way onto the ballot. They know that they can advertise, they know they can use social media, they know that they can prop up candidates fairly easily and guarantee a general election placement for any candidate. And then at that point, you also have the parties rigging the system and gamifying it. In Alaska right now, you even have somebody who is in prison in New York running for Congress there because the Republicans dropped out and it elevated a fifth or sixth place winner onto the top four. And that person, because of the Constitution, is eligible to run for office in Alaska. And that's something that right now, when you earn these nominations in Colorado, we're able to prevent these sort of nefarious actors from gaming the system, running for office in ways they shouldn't. But in Alaska, that's what we're seeing, and it's become a common trend of strategy and rigging the system there, under the system. All right, well, I'll let you, Mr. Theory, or Ms. Reynolds talk about, you know, kind of- I'll, I'll go ahead and go first, and then Amber can elaborate, because uh, those comments are so grotesquely misleading. Uh, Alaska is in a wonderful spot where for the first time people that are running have to appeal to the entire electorate, which like Colorado, they are 55% independent. But for a long time you would have called it a Republican state because it was, there were twice as many Republicans registered as Democrats, but it was 28 versus 14. The overwhelming majority of the citizens who have been ignored for so long with the existing conventional systems uh, were not paid attention to at all. Uh, and 52% of Alaska voters voted a split ticket, meaning I'm going to vote for a Republican for governor because I think he or she would be best, and I'm going to vote for a Democrat for senator because I think he or she would be best. Just like Colorado independents, which are now 48% continuing to climb, 64% of young adults under 34, and 85% of Generation Z say neither party has anything to offer them. And so Alaska, with 52% of people getting to vote when they want to for person over party, even if 80% of the time they vote Democratic, there's 20% of the time where they want the right and deserve the right to vote separately. And part of what's happened in Alaska, not only uh, some wonderful uh, increased diversity in terms of who's running, uh, but also that state legislature, which was totally gridlocked, that act they've actually formed a bipartisan majority governing caucus. Uh, and they told the fringe right and the fringe left, you're not even invited, because now with this new system, the way to get reelected is to get stuff done. Stuff like affordable housing, stuff like working on immigration, things like working on public safety. And so they formed a bipartisan, they could have called it a new party, and a bipartisan majority governing group to help get things done for their state. They finished a budget on time for the first time in years, et cetera. So, so Alaska is a great example for this cause, including the fact that something like 86% of the voters said totally understandable uh, and straightforward. 
Amber. Um, I would just add, so I've been an unaffiliated elector since I registered to vote, and, and when I was director of elections in Denver, I actually ran a number of primary elections where I couldn't participate, even though I was spending uh, an, a, a large number of hours at the office making sure everyone else could. And so when I worked on the option to open up the primaries, at least to give unaffiliated a chance to weigh in in those primaries, a lot of that was from personal experience, but it was also directly coming from the voters that were upset that they couldn't participate. And so one of the things I've always worked on, formerly as director in Denver, but now nationally, is making sure that all voters are uh, enfranchised and have the opportunity to participate in every election. And that is a core fundamental belief I have, and that is also one of the values of, of the Prop 131 and the reason this came about. Uh, I also served on the Independent Redistricting Commission, and for the first time, and Colorado had a more competitive map than they had had before. However, the fact of the matter is we have one of eight congressional seats that are actually competitive, and that is mainly because people have just, they've moved around the state and they live um, close to where some of their values are. They've kind of clustered themselves. Um, and, then, and then the state legislative districts are not, they're not as competitive as, as you would think. And part of the reason for that is that people live in communities and in constituencies where they've chosen to be, um, it's it's and it's actually hard to draw super competitive maps just because of that uh, way people have uh, sort of self-selected around the state. And so when you look at the primary turnout, um, and I'm and I was by the way part of designing the awesome voter access system that we have in Colorado. It's put us second in the nation in terms of voter turnout in the general. But if you look at the primary, the 2024 primary just had 26 percent turnout. And most of the seats for the state legislative body, but also Congress, given that they are not competitive later on, the election is in fact the primary. And so we have seen, and I'll use one congressional race, uh, that uh, Lauren Boeber basically got about 10% of the electorate voting for her, advancing her to a general election into a very safe seat. And I think that is a great illustration of the, pro the problem we have with our with our primary, and then that relating to the lack of competitiveness that we see go forward. And I know on my own ballot in Denver, there were very few competitive races, and there's a number of state reps that not only didn't don't have competition in the general, no one is running against them on the ballot, but had no one running for them in the primary. And I think that when we think about the voters, think about enfranchising people, we really have to make sure that voters have a meaningful voice when they're selecting their candidates uh, statewide. And so just some important context, too, so for folks who, who don't know, the fact that unaffiliated voters are allowed to vote in Colorado and also the redistricting, redistricting process um, is, is owed in large part to, to Mr. Theory, who, who uh, spent a lot of money to make those happen. Um, Shad, I'll, I'll turn to you because you're waving to me, and then I want to get to our elections, our current elections experts. I guess you're also an elections expert um, uh, in a moment. The folks are actually going to have to implement this, but go ahead, Shad. No, thank you for that. I think the facts, unfortunately, get in the way of that narrative. In Alaska, again, 30% of the seats there are only contested by a single primary in this general election, by a single party. Thank you, Martha. So a single party in 30% of seats in Alaska is guaranteed to get power. And so I would appreciate Kent proving the point that, yes, you are getting less ideological diversity, which means different coalitions get built. But that is not a means to an end for a more productive and engaged electorate. Also, the amendments that we passed a couple years ago that were meant to end partisan gerrymandering are a good thing. Unfortunately, those also failed. They've created safer incumbents across the state. With the exception of CD8, almost every single district became safer for a Republican or safer for a Democrat. So why would we pass this initiative to clean up that mess? I'll pass it to Martha. It should be on, yeah. It's on. I, I'll, I think I'll just let Jesse ask the... the all right. Well, well Molly, yeah, I want to turn to you. You have the uh, unique experience up here of, of actually running a ranked choice uh, voting election. Um, Boulder uh, decided to adopt it on the municipal front. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, you know, what your experience was there. Maybe before we do that, I just want to clarify. You guys have not, either the Clerks Association or personally, you haven't taken a position on the ballot measure, correct? OK. Here we go. I okay. really need that point to be clear. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. I'm Molly Fitzpatrick. I am the Boulder County Clerk and Recorder, and I am also president of the Colorado County Clerks Association. 
And apologies to you guys, I don't come to this conversation through the lens of the politics side of it. I come from the uh, really exciting administrative side of it. And I think about this question not only from Boulder County's perspective, but also as the association president, the perspective of all of our counties across the state. So as Jesse mentioned, in 2020, we knew that we were going to likely be implementing, well, in 2020, we did know that we would be implementing ranked choice voting for the first time for the city of Boulder residents. And so all in all, we had approximately three years to plan for ranked choice voting. And to be really clear, um, my county, we have roughly 14 full-time staff. We have a robust IT department. We have a contract with a uh, technology company in the city of Boulder that's been a long-standing relationship. And that is all really important context because um, nothing was developed and there's still a lot of questions out there about ranked choice voting. Very early on, we hired a project manager who was fully uh, looking at this question of how do we implement, because ranked choice voting does touch every single thing that an elections office does. It touches voter education, candidate education, media education, how voters mark their ballot, how to adjudicate voter error, um, election night results, risk limiting audit. Um, it touches um, tabulation questions, recount preparation, you know, what do you do in a recount, how do you release results. Um, there are a lot of unanswered questions, and so we were in the fortunate and unfortunate position of Boulder County calling all the shots when it came to those important policy questions and considerations. So, um, you know, we were in a position, again, where we, you know, I consider myself one of the best resource counties in the state, so we had support and resources that thought through these policy questions. These policy questions need to be made, in my opinion, at the state level. It's appropriate to have a central um, uh, or a, a common base on how we implement elections in the state of Colorado. And right now, I would say that doesn't exist in the way that it does for a plurality contest in the way for, for ranked choice voting. So, you know, I think for me, the biggest question is, um, how are we going to get this done before 2026? I think that's the rub for me, especially when I think about our small counties, Teller County, uh, Custer County, and I'm just naming some small counties that have really gone through um, significant upheaval these past few years with what's been going on in elections. And I wanna make sure that every single county can do this and do it well, because I know that you know, with our experience, um, this, isn't, this is something that you know, I, we did successfully. Um, but when we talk about these technology systems, they are not ready. Um, when we talk about the training uh, that needs to happen for election officials, that is not developed. So, you know, we can snap our fingers on a timeline and say, um, these systems are ready for you, go. Does that timeline accommodate testing? In our testing, we, you know, kept finding errors, and that's the purpose of testing. But we need to make sure that we have enough time to test these systems, enough time to train election officials, enough time to train the public and then uh, update every SOP, every training procedure, every judge manual, and that stuff does take time. And so I you know, come to this uh, conversation from that lens. So um, I don't know if you can see on your left. So Amber had us, we were able to get this up. Um, is this pretty much kind of what the ballot looked like in Boulder, just for folks to see? I'm, I'm curious if you can kind of talk about that, basically how to, how to fill this out. Is, was that the experience that you guys had with, your, um, with the ballot that you guys had for the municipal? election? Yeah, there, there again are different, uh, because this isn't necessarily prescriptive in, there's some things that are laid out in Rule 26 about ranked choice voting, but not a lot. Um, there, so yes, we had voter instructions at the top of our ballot with a ranked choice voting contest below it. Okay. And Eric, I don't know if you can, or whoever the tech guy, if you can switch back over to the um, uh, slide, that'd be great, whoever can come up here. For whatever reason, my fingers won't work on that. So I want to drill down on a couple things you said. First of all, yes, the ballot measure says 2026, but given what happened at the end of the le legislative session, that's probably not going to happen. Um, and we'll, I want to talk about that um, in a second. But you know, if this is the will of the voters, right, and you guys have two years to get this done, um, Alaska's done it, Maine's done it, you've got uh, uh, top X primaries in uh, California um, and in, in Washington, why can't you get it done in two years? I mean, is it is it something you just can't do, period? And, and it sounds like you're the resource, right? So could you, do you feel like you could teach your colleagues across the state and, and either of you, one of you can respond to that? You know, I if, if this ballot measure were to pass, clerks are absolutely going to take the lead on implementing legislation. 
um, to make sure that it's appropriate and sets counties up for success. And again, like I said earlier, puts a lot of the requirements on the Secretary of State's office, which is appropriate. They are the ones who should be developing this technology. They're the ones who should you know, create more rulemaking, training for election officials, voter education, which I think the voter education plan would need to um, be even more robust than the 2018 plan to educate voters about, you know, you're unaffiliated, choose either one, because we are still seeing a lot of spoilage on those ballots. So I think that the campaign would need to be even more robust. Uh, there are over a dozen new terms, I would say, that voters will need to know in order to understand tabulation. And I think we have a very engaged um, set of voters in our state of Colorado, and they need to know kind of under the hood, what does the math look like? Um, everything from round, inactive ballot, duplicate uh, ranking, skipped ranking, um, you know, uh, threshold, non-transferable total, batch elimination, like these are all important words and vocabulary that the public would need to know about. I don't think that a county clerk who has maybe a half-time staff or a full-time staff should take that work on. That needs to be the secretary's responsibility. And what I would say is ask them. Ask them what their timeline is and what they could get done. And who also who's paying for it. I think there's a lot of unanswered questions out there and I don't, you know, I would I absolutely lend my expertise as the only county to do this in a modern voting system in Colorado 100%. I'm just volunteering you. Yeah. For that role. <laughs> um, and I am respectfully declining to run the statewide uh, <laughs> campaign on this. I don't know. <laughs> Secretary of State, you could run in 2026. Um, okay, so coming back this way, Mr. Crane, I do wanna, um, so I wanna talk about what happened at the end of the legislative session, because that's important for this conversation. Um, for those who don't know, there was an amendment added to a broader elections bill kind of at the tail end of the session. The amendment was passed in about a minute, and what it said was that the changes in Proposition 131, should it pass, would not go into effect unless a dozen um, municipalities of certain de de certain demographics, certain population size, uh, would run municipal ranked choice voting elections. The governor almost vetoed the bill because he was uh, so upset about what was in it. Um, I know there was there was a lot of outcry on it, but the governor signed it with the understanding that said, "Okay, let's come back to the table and try and get this done." We think by 2028. I'll also mention the governor has now endorsed Proposition 131. Mr. Theory told me that actually uh, Mayor Mike Johnson, um, Denver Mayor Mike Johnson endorsed it today too. Um, so I guess my question for you, Mr. Crane, is, is like, is 2028 reasonable? Are the clerks on board with making that happen um, given kind of what the governor has promised? Obviously he's, he's telling the legislature what to do. The legislature can do whatever it wants, but um, is, that, is that feasible in your mind? Um, okay. This is on, okay, good. Uh, Matt Crane, just to come back to it, Matt Crane, Executive Director of the Colorado County Clerks Association, former Arapahoe County Clerk, uh, Colorado election expert, uh, been doing this for about almost 25 years now. Um, I think what, and I think what you heard, what you heard Molly say is, if the systems are in place, we can run a successful election. Um, but we have great reservations that the systems will be in place. By 2026, even this week, representatives from the Secretary of State's office expressed concerns about being able to make these systems uh, ready for 2026. And when we look at what has happened in election administration over the last four years, and what's happened with the stolen election lies and all of that kind of thing, and what clerks have had to go through to convince people they actually do vote on a paper ballot, right? We hear that all the time. We want to vote on paper. What do you, your mail ballot's paper, right? Every ballot cast in Colorado is on paper. So we very much right now are at the basics of voter education around what really happens in elections and what doesn't. And when you're talking about a seismic shift like this, should the voters pass it, we will do what we've always done, which is go to the mattresses to implement this properly. But it has to be done in a way that puts the voters first and not changing outcomes or anything else. Uh, that has to be down the line. And if, so that's where we come from, from the association is, yes, we can do this if these systems are in place. But our concerns were, we weren't, you know, our, our concerns were kind of being uh, pushed to the side during conversations about this. And so when you talk about the amendment and why we supported the amendment, because we needed to make sure that Colorado voters heard from the experts who are running Colorado elections now, that there are concerns. We can do this, we will do this if the voters charge us with it, but People need to be aware of the challenges of implementing this too soon. And right now with voter confidence the way, this is, the way it is, where people, a large part of our population doesn't trust election outcomes now. If there's a mistake with this, 
it will dramatically undercut voter confidence going forward. So yes, we can, but we need to do it the right way. But, but I guess 2026, that's what the measure says, but it's, it's not gonna happen based on the amendment, right? So it, it's 2028. I mean, you, I, do you really think that like 12 municipalities are gonna run a ranked choice voting election between now and, I mean, I, I just don't see well, that. Well, some have already done it. Right. I think others are going to be doing it. Um, but in turn, if 2028, if these systems are in place where it doesn't walk us backwards, or if we don't say we can put a Band-Aid on it until later, that's not acceptable to us when our folks are on the front lines and facing intimidation and death threats and those kinds of things. So if it is not up to our normal standards with how we conduct elections now, which Amber said is among the best in the, in the nation, we will not compromise on quality to rush something through. All right, a Amber and Ken, I, yeah. Let me cover a couple aspects of that and then Amber can provide some really important and compelling history on something like this because she's been such a key player for the last decade. Uh, but we agree with a lot of what's been said. We absolutely believe that there has to be a significant investment in a very thoughtful implementation plan, and it needs to be well-resourced. We're in conversations with the governor and his team right now, working out how many millions of dollars to put into the proposed budget uh, in order to provide the clerks and others with the resources they need. And that'll be a very active part of the implementation planning uh, bill that has to happen uh, after, the, after the general election. So we. We agree there needs to be a very thoughtful, comprehensive investment with respect to resources for technology, resources on voter education, et cetera. And we plan on meeting and offering to meet with every single clerk in the, in the state in order to find out exactly what their needs are in the right way to uh, address those needs. So we agree with the importance and, and the uh, significance of that investment, and we are going to work super hard to make that happen, and, and Amber can provide some additional uh, commentary from a historical perspective as to how doable that is, but I'll just say that there are already 64 places across the country that do rank voting. Uh, is, and there's all, there's an ecosystem of nonprofit entities that will provide free support in terms of technology, in terms of voter education material, in terms of marketing material, et cetera. All of those national partners of ours are ready to help. Uh, and, and we can benefit from that immensely, both from an insight and experience avoiding mistakes, et cetera. So we, we totally agree there needs to be an incredibly thoughtful plan. We have done it before in this state, and we can do it again. And I'll let Amber talk about how this compares to what's been done in the past. Um, well, thank you. And just a couple of points. First, um, I come from the community of election officials, and Colorado does have by far the most dedicated and, and talented election officials. and. The other thing I wanted to add is these conversations around ranked choice and these methods have actually been going on with the county clerks for a while in terms, uh, in terms of implementing at the local level, but also uh, conversations around it. In fact, Matt, Matt and I have been friends for about 20 years, and we've had number, a number of conversations um, about this measure, but also about implementing ranked choice voting in presidential primaries. That the legislation has occurred over the last few years. And this measure actually was modified many times based on some of that feedback that was heard, not only in the presidential process, but then when the ballot measures first were filed with other requirements in them. And so there's been significant um, conversation, modifications, all of that as this has transpired, which I think is really important. The second thing, I actually was at the county clerk's conference two years ago when the municipality ranked choice voting was coming up and spoke and, and shared a lot of the national resources that Molly mentioned that, you know, that were used to implement in Boulder. In fact, um, I engaged with Molly's project manager when Boulder was looking at this and sent all the national resources and best practices and all the things that could help um, Boulder. So the cool thing about the election official community is exactly that collaboration and uh, sharing of, of best practices and resources, and I'll be the first one to say that implementation is the most important part of any change that we make to our election systems. And when we did to the 2013 legislation, you know, one, some of the opponents actually suggested, well, why don't we just pilot vote by mail and vote centers and all these changes you're making in certain counties? And I was a staunch advocate against that, mainly because now we're just gonna create more confusion for voters statewide in a statewide news cycle, information they're hearing. When you say, let's do one thing in one county and have another county doing a different process, that actually in and of itself creates more confusion. We see that happen and play out all around the country in various uh, systems. So what we've proposed here is actually 
by design to make sure there is consistency statewide and sort of piecemealing it out will create implementation challenges like what Molly had to experience in Boulder when the state was not invested in helping her do this because she was on her own doing it. And so as in my experience, especially when we implemented vote by mail and vote centers and all these things, it is far better to do it as a state, bring in collaboration, make sure that the Secretary of State's office is held to account for their role and, and making sure that gets done. And certainly, I'll be the first one to say that implementation is, is, is the most important uh, success measure in this, in this being um, a successful implementation. And so we, we, we have to dedicate the resources. And like you said, Jesse, there are many nationwide, given how this reform has expanded in various places. OK, I want to ask one follow-up, then we'll go to Matt, then we'll go to the, um, uh, Martha and Chad. So uh, my first question just is, my my legislative years peaked up, peaked up, perked up when I heard uh, you talk about spending. Right? Where do you find like millions of dollars in the state budget to to send to um, you know county clerks? Right? Uh, uh, Matt knows about unfunded mandates. My colleague Brian Eason's back there. He's the budget nerd among us. Um, I mean, like the governor can ask for things, but but do you have a sense of what it would cost and you know what gets cut? I guess in the budget to make that happen. Thank you. Uh, the normal legislative process uh, that, you know, of course, there's tough trade-offs for any community to make or any family to make. Uh, and in the context of the overall budget of the state uh, and the importance of elections to a democracy, this is pennies per person per vote. Uh, and so it's, and it's not a billion dollars at all. But that's something for us and the legislature and the governor to, to sort out with a detailed plan, which is what we're already working on. We're literally spending hours and hours per week listening to people, asking questions here in Colorado and elsewhere to figure out what is the most economically efficient way of getting a very important thing done for the lifeblood of our country, which is our democracy. And so we don't have a perfect answer today, but we're going to be spending thousands of hours with experts in the state and outside to figure that out going forward. And the, and the governor's team, they're, they're right now making some of those tough trade-offs about how to fund X million dollars so that the clerks are well supported in, uh, in doing this. Matt, did you want to jump in? Yeah, well, I just wanted to come back. I, you know, I agree with Amber. Uh, while we were on different sides in, in 2013, um, she's right. The people who said we should do a pilot were foolish. They were, quite frankly, stupid. Um, and there's a, there's a reason for that. It's because Colorado had a long history with vote by mail before we got to 2013. So it's not like 2013 was the first time people in Colorado got a mail ballot. Colorado went to no excuse absentee voting in the late 90s. We went to permanent mail-in voting around 2005. We went to all mail ballot primaries in 2008-ish. So by the time th 2013 came around, we had 15 years to learn and grow in a mail ballot environment and culture. We weren't starting from scratch. What we're concerned about is now we're starting from scratch with very little runway on rate choice voting. No question we are. Um, and so when we talk about should it be tried before, like mail ballot was, should it be tried before it gets to a place? I mean, that would be our preference. But when we talk about the timelines, we feel the legislation uh, is, is uh, or excuse me, the initiative needs a lot, is gonna need a lot of work at the legislature. There's a lot of gaps in the legislation and we've identified that before. So we go through the legislative cycle in 2025. Then there's rulemaking that has to go after that, which will be, which will be a difficult process as well. Systems, the state, rightfully so, will probably be pretty slow to start updating systems until all the requirements are set. And one of the frustrating things for us is the requirements weren't a part of the initiative. So everybody could see everything that would need to be touched if voters choose this. So then we're talking about the fall of 2025 to change what we identify as at least eight different systems. That's before we get to voter educate, election, election official education, because election officials need a lot of work on this, and then voter education on this. So basically, we have a, a year or less from election day in 2026, from the general election in 2026, to implement this, implement this. That's not even including the primary, where we have some issues with the way that the initiative was written around but the primary. I, just, I, I don't want to cut you off, but it, I mean, is it really going to happen? I just want to come no, back I to just, this. No, right? I just want to be very clear, because this has been a point of contention where our concerns, quite frankly, haven't been taken seriously. And so when, we, when you ask about the amendment that we supported, this is why. There are serious concerns with rushing implementation. 
if everything's in place in 2028 and we can, we can run a successful election, yes. But when you talk about the amendment and our concerns about this, our concerns are very real. Um, okay, I wanna, I wanna shift to, to Shad and Martha um, and give you guys some, some time here. So I, I wanna ask, Shad and I, you and I have talked about this before, but it seems like from my perspective when I look around the country at this debate, oftentimes uh, the, the folks who oppose a switch to this system are the ones who are in charge, right? You guys are the, the kind of the partisans on stage, Democrats control politics in Colorado. Um, and uh, the, the sw shift in um, Alaska was very good for Democrats, where it was a state that had been dominated by Republicans in the past. So, I mean, is, is there some of this, is some of your opposition to this, does it have to do with just the idea that, um, you know, you guys, you guys control the power and this might shake up the status quo? No, the concern that we have is right now 93% of Colorado elections are competed in. We have one Democrat who's running against a Republican, there's unaffiliated to petition on. That is really important for the public to have. The concern is that uh, to take an Alaska model and import it into Colorado, which has a massive, massive population increase, and when you look at that system, again, I, I will just make sure folks know right now, 93% of Colorado seats are competed in. In Alaska, 30% of the seats are single party general elections. I cannot imagine a worse way to provide for competition or to talk about how we actually have a competition of ideas in rural areas or in uh, front range areas or in the state as a whole than by limiting the amount of people who participate because they see the system as an uphill battle. That was awesome. Um, the other thing there is I think what, what Ken Theory was just saying is actually a really important point to prove for the clerks here putting this idea forward and not having those details on what are we cutting to fund this? Are we cutting schools? Are we cutting Medicare, Medicaid? Are we cutting housing initiatives? What are we cutting to pay for a system that we know has resulted in single party general elections in Alaska and floods of narc money? The additional point that I'm a little bit concerned about is the proponents of the initiative actually kind of gave up the game for why they're pushing this on their very own fact sheet in very small print at the very bottom on the back side saying, Colorado's regulatory environment is dysfunctional for us, and so we need a new system. And so this system is created for who exactly, and to what end, and what regulations are we uncomfortable with? The other question I'd have is, what clerks are in these conversations with Mr. Theory's team and the governor? Are election officials included? Are folks actually at the table of making these difficult, difficult cuts to fund a system that will result in floods of dark money, single party general elections, and confusing ballots? My final point before I wanna hand it to Martha is, if this was such a common sense system, why is it only impacting some races and not others? And so voters are gonna have multiple different rules for multiple different uh, ballots uh, across the state. That doesn't sound like consistency to me. Yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, Martha Tierney. Um, I, I just wanna hit on a couple of points that Chad made and that others have made. Um, and I think it's really important to remind ourselves that you know we, we do have one of the best systems in the country and so this measure will light a bomb under that system and upend it. And so we have to be really confident that, that what we are changing is the right thing to change. And I'm not so sure it is. I don't think it's been thought out well. There are only two states in the country that do uh, have this system. Only Alaska has the top four uh, coming out of the primary system and um, I just don't think it's baked enough. Uh, I'll point you to a University of Minnesota study, so a nonpartisan study coming out of the Hubert Humphrey Center, uh, and note that Minneapolis does do ranked choice voting in their municipal elections. Uh, that study looked at the promises that the proponents of ranked choice voting were making, like less divisive politics, uh, more people of color getting elected, um, uh, they also uh, looked at the promise that more moderate candidates would get elected. And all of those uh, promises were debunked by the study. They found that ranked choice voting did not deliver on those promises. And if you look at the materials for the pro Prop 131 campaign, those are the promises they are making. So I urge you to look at that University of Minnesota study if you Google that study, it'll come right up. I also think it's important for people to know who opposes this measure. This is a measure that very few people thought up without 
coming to the county clerks association or the county clerks. Uh, they didn't come to other election officials in the state. They certainly didn't listen to the political party's concerns about it. And they just put it on the ballot with Mr. Theory's money. And it's, so I want to remind you all who opposes this measure. So from the disability community, from Latino rights communities, um, from uh, the LGBTQ community, to the Ministerial Alliance and the Interfaith Alliance, to um, a, a number of environmental organizations, to a number of labor organizations, to the Criminal Co Justice Coalition, um, on and on, Colorado Common Cause, uh, New Era Colorado, which works with young voters. Um, the list is long, and you can find it on the, the, pro, the opposition um, campaign to Proposition 131. And I think that's important because all you're hearing is television ads that say everybody loves this, and those television ads are just funded by Mr. Theory. It's not like a big coalition out there that loves this measure. Um, and it's really important, I think, for us to think about upending our system before we really understand what it's going to do, who it's going to benefit, and make this drastic change to our system. Um, I will give you a second. I want to ask, I want to fact check something and then also just ask two follow ups uh, quickly. So, first of all, yes, Mr. Theory has spent a lot of money on it, but there, there are some other folks who have, have spent money on it as well. But I think Mr. Theory is one of the, the predominant uh, spenders for, for the group. Um, Shad, first question I want to ask you. So, you talk a lot about you know, these one candidate uh, or one party races in, in um, Alaska, but the way you know, I've covered politics here for a long time. There are basically, these are de facto one party races, right? If I look at Senate districts or House districts that are in Denver and Boulder, sure you've got maybe a contested primary and there's a Republican who's, who's up there as a sacrificial lamb, but they're not gonna win, right? Same thing in El Paso County. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking about those congressional districts. So why not, you know, the proponents of this talk about it as a way to include more of the electorate in making that decision, especially in these districts where they are so dominated by one party or the other in terms of you know, voter lean, voter turnout. Um, you know, how, how do you kind of square that? I hope Mr. Theory answers that question because his independent redistricting commission was a great idea implemented terribly, gamed by special interests, and has created safer districts for Republicans and Democrats across the state. And I'll even throw out my own party there. Congressman Neguse got a safer district. Congresswoman DeGette got a safer district. Lauren Boebert got a safer district that she still had to run from. Uh, Ken Buck got a safer district. Uh, the only competitive district that was made at a congressional level was CD8. And that's a shame. That redistricting commission was an absolute failure in creating competitive districts. And so this initiative is being proposed as a way to reduce extremism in politics. Why are we cleaning up that mess with something that's already broken? Why aren't we spending time on fixing that? And the argument that only a certain percentage of voters are making an impact in this election discards the other voters who are making actual real choices in their elections. If they want to elect a Republican, they should. Those communities, if they need Republican values and Republican leadership to have their voice here in the state capitol or a county commission or for president or for wherever, they should. The same should be eligible for Democrats. To create a system based on a misnomer that only a small number of voters are choosing the outcome of an election is a little bit silly because it discards everyone in this room who might already have a strong value set, you've already aligned yourself with a candidate or a party or whatever, to be able to make that decision. So that argument is, in my opinion, a misnomer because it's telling you that your vote doesn't count, and that's not fair. I will say, you guys did win some Republican districts after the redistricting process, right? I'm thinking of Bob Marshall, and um, it worked out pretty well for, for Democrats. Sure, and I mean, I disagree with Bob Marshall on plenty of things. The Democratic Party is a big tent. We're excited to be running community leaders who represent Republicans and affiliates and Democrats. Our concern is not necessarily political power for a political party. Our concern is making sure that we have representatives that actually represent their communities. If that happens to have a D after the name, they deserve someone like Bob Marshall, who is an advocate for justice, for press freedom, for making sure that he's putting his party in a place of accountability on items that are important to a more conservative community. When he's running against folks who are election deniers, who are you know, breeding grounds for all sorts of calamity, then of course a Democrat might prevail in that system. But the same could be true of a Republican uh, in a Democratic district. And that's what this system that we currently exist in, which is the gold standard of elections allows. Again, this system that is being proposed has not been thought out. Clearly the details are being sorted out. We don't even know what we're cutting yet to implement it. 
it's also gonna result in single party general elections across the state, and that to me just isn't choice. All right, I wanna give you guys plenty of time to respond to all of that, um, so go for it, I, I, yeah. We'll go ahead and, and start, and again, I, I just appreciate you being willing to invest all this time. Um, first on the money front, I'm contributing a, a fraction of, of what is being spent. Uh, and I think it's really important for America that people in, that have been financially fortunate spend money for the good of society. Uh, but uh, on beyond that, the Minnesota study, I want you to take very careful note of this, uh, very careful note, because it speaks to uh, the data that supports or does not support the words they're saying. That University of Minnesota study was one graduate student, one professor, and it's a three-page, almost a memo. Uh, so that's what it is. Now, Go to their website and, and check that out. Go to our website and see all the different references. And let me just talk about a couple. MIT Election and Science Lab, which is generally regarded as the best, most authoritative place, uh, coming out and saying there's an extensive body of literature supporting the notion that instant runoff voting re increases representation for marginalized groups and racial groups, uh, et cetera. You can go through, go to our website and see reference after reference with respect to the ability to implement, how much uh, voters like it, uh, and what it does in terms of competitive and diverse elections. So just go out and check out each website. Um, in addition, this thing about uh, Alaska, let's look at what we have here right now. What, what are the numerical facts about, because once you hear them, you're gonna be uncomfortable and a little embarrassed. It, it is literally 85% of districts that are party safe, one way or the other. And the gerrymandering reform, it would be lower otherwise, but there is still work to do there, and we hope to continue that, that journey. But 80, the reality is 85% are either dominantly or dominantly are. Right away, that means in the current system, that let's say that means the minority party is usually 38% or something, or 40, and the dominant party is 60. You're taking 38% of the voters of Colorado and telling them for the next 20 years, it is unlikely they will ever cast a single meaningful vote for a legislative position at the federal or state level. That's not a healthy democracy. If someone came to us 200 years ago and said, here's a democracy idea. Oh, oh by the way, 40% of the people are permanently disenfranchised from casting a meaningful vote. We'd go, I think we can do better than that. But then you go, okay, so the primary is the general 85% of the time. Uh, hopefully the, the dominant party primaries are super competitive. No, 70% of the time, there's literally one person on the ballot between 65 and 70, somewhere in that neighborhood. And so if you do the math, maybe there's 150 people in this room, 13% of you got to cast a meaningful vote where the outcome was somewhat in question last year. The other 87% of the people in this room uh, casted votes, which is why, of course, only 26% show up for the primaries, because they don't have their voice and they don't have their choice. Um, and so our democracy right now is why, the way our democracy is working is why so many of the people under 40 uh, are unhappy, frustrated, angry, and scared. Uh, I've got a son 35 and a daughter 33, and they just say, you know, Dad, why are you spending all your time and money on this? Because this thing is really broken. Uh, that's terrible for a democracy, to have so many young people saying, my vote doesn't matter, and they're mathematically accurate when they say that. Um, I'll turn it over to Amber. And Amber, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about, I, I, were you in the legislative or congressional redistricting? Okay, maybe you can talk a little bit about that too. Well, if I can just hit one more thing about who's representing who. Uh, thank you so much, okay. Amber. Um, we, we, we've made our, public, our polling public. We've done it three or four times over the year. It's very consistent. 64% of voters want to move in this direction. It's about 75% in their party. Uh, who's on their side? Lauren Boebert. Who's on our side? Jared Polis. Who's on their side? Dave Williams and Tina Peters. Who's on our side? Mike Johnston. Um, and then go look, again, go to the websites. Look at the endorsements for our measure. They're incredibly uh, spread across the entire political spectrum. D's, R's, and I's, because people want a voice again in their democracy. Um, well, I just want to add on the, um, so the, the Minnesota um, study slash essay, it, it is very, um, it is light on details in terms of the analysis, and as Kent mentioned, there's a number of studies. MIT has a number of studies regarding RCV. There's also a number of research institutions that have looked at the, at the direct impacts. But one of the other ways to look at the direct impacts is actually look at the direct data. 
So in New York City, when they implemented this, they went from a minority woman city council to a 61% women city council, and majority of those women were women of color that represented the, the vast majority of diversity in New York City. Uh, you, when you look at where RCV has been implemented in cities and municipalities around the country, women have a far higher representation at the local level. And I bring up women's representation because that's another thing that uh, is very and dearly important to me, and I continue to work on that. And when you look in the international context, where RCV is an element of electoral systems, there is fairer representation, especially for women and marginalized groups. Uh, and there are multiple studies that have, that have indicated this. So that's one of the reasons why I'm sitting here and supporting this initiative and being a part of this. The second thing that I wanted to just say is, you know, when the, the wonderful thing about Colorado is we've had a pioneering spirit about improving the voting experience for every single voter in the state. And I've been a part of that work with most of us on this stage that have been a part of that together. Um, but also, I want to add to that that we, every year, there is an election cleanup bill because we continue to improve, and we should. And there are new things right now. In fact, I just talked to a few clerks recently that we're still waiting for guidance from the Secretary of State's office from legislation that was just implemented for, for guidance for this election. This is a normal part of the process in Colorado, and it should be to continually to improve the system and the process and make sure every voice is represented in this state. I, when I look at the primary election and 26% turnout and most voters having no contests on their ballots, one of my ballots, I, I, I vote in Denver, the Republican ballot I received as an unaffiliated voter had zero contests and there were multiple notes that said there is no one running for this office. On the Democratic side, uh, there were races that had, again, no competition. The election happened in the primary. And so we have to look and not ignore what voters are telling us. And I would also just say, you know, when, as an election official, as an election official, when you hear what the voters are telling us through the data, through the lack of turnout, through the even undervotes, undervotes are a great way to determine what voters think of their choices. In fact, in the CD1 race in the recent primary in Denver, there was almost 10% undervotes because there was no choice for that race for voters. And so we saw people selecting the Democratic ballot, undervoting the Congressional District 1 race. Those are all indicators that we've got to do something to make sure people have choice and voice. And, uh, and, and the final point I would just um, make is um, county clerks are very busy right now. Many, all of them that I've talked to know that I've talked to them. I'm very conscientious of their time. I don't want to take up a lot of their time. But these are, are I, the conversations have happened. Matt and I get, we often end up late at night on calls talking about all kinds of things and debating all kinds of issues. Um, but, but there are conversations ongoing. The clerk's voices are, are the most important in terms of how a successful implementation would look. And those conversations will and have to continue just as they have on any change that happens in Colorado's law right now. I, I want to ask one question, then I'll toss to you guys, then we'll go down the line. Um, you talk about you know voters not filling out their ballots. I consider myself a mildly smart person. And I, and I have a lot of trouble explaining what ranked choice voting is to, to readers. So isn't there a threat here that by doing this, you're going to end up with people who look at the ballot and either fill it out incorrectly or just say, I, I can't do this? Um, you know, how, do you, how do you kind of respond to that? Well, where we've seen it implemented and then where we've seen it expanded, uh, so as an example, Governor Walz in Minnesota expanded the uh, ability to use ranked choice voting because of the success of many of the jurisdictions in Minneapolis and others that have used this. And also the expansion that Governor Whitmer just signed in Michigan are good examples of expansions where it, it has worked and voters uh, feel confident in it. Where we also have seen RCV uh, used, voters have high confidence, fill out the ballot correctly, ha want to use it again, have high confidence in that. And the numbers, when I say the numbers are high, they're like over 85% in all these places, including uh, some of the, the results that came out of Boulder. So, and, and the good thing is, there are incredible resources. The Center for Civic Design, which has worked with Colorado on a lot of ballot design and instructional issues, have done extensive field studies on what works best to not only instruct the voters on the ballot, how to design a ballot, which that ballot that you had on screen 
uses those principles, there are great practices in place uh, to do this. And so the good thing is a lot of those resources exist and there are partners that can help do this, um, which wouldn't have existed you know, five to 10 years ago. Do you know what, just off the top of your head, uh, do you know what your spoilage rate was in the older election? Um, I don't have that data with me, but what I can tell you is that we should be thoughtful about ballot design. That decision, that's a policy decision, in my opinion, that the secretary's office needs to really consider for the state. You know, we, again, we were in the driver's seat for every single conversation. And my approach is, you know, you don't want every county approaching it from a different perspective, you know, making their own shots. Otherwise, voters are going to get treated differently, potential confusion. And um, so I do think that you're right, Jesse, this is harder to explain. Um, we uh, found that properly marking your ballot was a big part of our effort, but the tabulation was where we got the most amount of confusion. Um, and this is why I think it is so important for us to have robust training for election officials. Because I will tell you that, you know, you think you got it, you think you got it. You get asked a question and you're like, shoot, I got have to go, you know, pull a technical expert. Um, in these small counties, there is no technical, you know, the clerk is doing everything. So it cannot be stated enough how important it is for the secretary's office to spend some serious time developing training for election officials. There's, again, about over a dozen terms that we introduce to the public. Um, again, best one of the best resource counties, the city of Boulder also spent considerable time, money, and resources educating their voters about tabulation. It was around tabulation um, for us. That was where we got all of the questions, a lot of the questions. Um, and again, I go back to 2018, you know, the secretary's office really took the lead on the You Choose campaign. Again, this is much more complicated. Um, and I think, to me, the investment is important because our voters are really educated here. Our voters care about how their elections work. They're really proud. As, as Martha said, we have the best election system in the country that balances access, that balances security. Our voters understand it. Our voters will want to understand this. And so that is why it is so important that we take that model of the secretary's office being the one to really push out the messaging around, you know, properly marking your ballot. What is RCV? Here's how you tabulate it. Um, here's the 14 plus words that you'll want to know. Um, and here's how you explain it to your voters. Um, again, that is appropriate for the state to take on. A small county cannot do that. Their voters will be confused because they do not have the resources capacity to do that. And it is going to cost a lot more is my, I, I would plan if I were in that office to spend way more money on this than in 2018. And again, my question is, who's paying for that? I'll give, yeah. yeah, I want to give you the floor and then we'll... Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to touch on a few things that have been said. Um, and first, before I forget, uh, one of the groups I didn't list out who does not like this measure is the Colorado Ranked Choice Voting Group. Um, so that's an important uh, data point for you all. They do not like this measure. Um, another thing that Molly was just talking about uh, is the ballot design, and I think it's really important to talk about this, uh, and I also want to talk about timing. So the ballot design, because this measure only covers about half the races, um, the clerks are going to have to decide, and or the secretary will have to decide, are these all going to be on one ballot, or are they going to be on two? So you have one ballot that is ranked choice voting with some races on it, and one ballot that is not. Or is it going to be on the same? So think of a presidential year. You'll have president, not ranked choice voting, so there'll have to be instructions at the top. Then you're going to go into a whole bunch of races that are ranked choice voting, so there'll have to be instructions and those kinds of races. Then you're going to go back to a whole bunch of races that are not ranked choice voting. And one of the things that I think we can expect is when you go back to those races that aren't ranked choice voting, people are going to overvote because they're not going to realize that now they're in a... a a part of the ballot that isn't ranked choice voting. So that's one thing I think we have to be really careful about. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, and Molly touched on this a little bit as well, and that's uh, ballot tabulation and processing and timing. So in both New York City and Alaska, it was weeks until election results were made, were um, announced. And um, if you think about the concerns we already have and the, the big lie language that we are already seeing and the threats to election officials, that w spending waiting weeks until we get results is going to be a big problem. The other way to do it is to announce them as you go, as you do your rounds, which is what they did in Boulder, 
But the problem with that, which may be equally concerning, is that the, the person who got dropped off in the first time you saw the results is going to be back in the next time you see the results, maybe. And so there's going to be all sorts of questions about whether this is, um, that there's something funny going on in the tabulation because the voters aren't going to understand all those terms. They aren't going to understand all the, the ways that the ranked choice voting ballot is tabulated. And as they see these different results come out and change and change and change, it is going to um, be, there's going to be a lot of question about the integrity of the election. So again, I go back to, I just don't think it's quite baked. Can I, can I just ask, so on Alaska, maybe someone knows the answer, answer to this question, but I'm thinking in Colorado, for instance, like we didn't know in Lauren Boebert's race for weeks just simply because the race was close. And I believe at least the congressional race in Alaska was particularly close, right, which, which was why it, it lasted weeks. Was, was that because, do you know if it was because ranked choice or was well, it because? Well, first of all, Alaska always takes weeks because it's, they have to use dog sleds and helicopters and planes for a lot of the outlying areas. So again, just take note of who's citing facts that are misleading and which facts actually help you understand that. Alaska always takes a long time because of the uh, nature of the distributed population and very places where there's no roads. And you still have to wait for those votes. But Amber, you might be able to cover other aspects. I, 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 mean, I would like to just, uh, for one second, in 2016, uh, when we put in the ballot, uh, try to create the right for independents to vote in one primary or the other, both major parties were against that. And both major parties cited all the implementation risks of doing that well, because now you suddenly had to mail out multiple ballots to some people and they had to choose. These are all the right concerns. They were the right concerns then, they're the right concerns now, and we solved them. We, we did it, despite it. But it gets interesting that most major parties were against it. Probably half of the people in this room are independent. They didn't want you to have the right to vote in primaries. They didn't want to give you the right to vote for the person you most wanted, not the party. Uh, and this is the group that's opposing you today. And what's so ironic about all the things they're saying about ranked choice voting is the Colorado Democratic Party platform. From two, 2006 was the first time they came out and said, we want to do ranked choice voting, instant runoff, whatever the phraseology. Nine times since then, they have reaffirmed that. I mean, I'll give you just one flavor of the Demo Colorado Democratic Party language on this issue where they're trying to scare you to ensure better representation and more fair elections. Those are their words about ranked choice voting. As recently as 2022, their words replaced plurality voting with methods that allow voters to rank candidates. Okay, so nine times in a row, that's the position their party took. Then they achieved supermajority status and they're against it. There we go. Um, we are at time. I'm going to let everybody uh, get one last, but uh, we're going to go down the line here. I will say, fun fact, Los Angeles, they fly ballots via helicopter because it's such a spread out city. Um, uh, Shad, go ahead. If you can keep it very, keep it brief, then I want to end with a question for the, uh, for the uh, clerks. No one is disputing that ranked choice voting could have a role in some elections. But that's why Martha's point is so interesting that ranked choice voting for Colorado doesn't support this measure. Because they're looking at this package in totality and see an absolute failure on the horizon for Colorado elections. Now, when we take a look at Lauren Boebert and Dave Williams also being opposed to this, a broken clock is right twice a day. And what this measure is doing is it's shoveling sand with a pitchfork. It is not gonna fix our elections. When you take a look at the other folks who are opposing this initiative, you've got people who rep or organizations who represent teachers, democracy rights advocates, uh, young voters, the Interfaith Alliance. When you take a look at who's funding this initiative, yeah, it's true. Kent Theory, maybe you are just a portion of the funders. The other is the CEO of Netflix. Hasn't put out a good movie in like 20 years. You also have the Waltons. It's been a rough couple of years for the Broncos. I love the Broncos. So when we're taking a look at this record of failure from folks who are forcing a system down on us, they haven't thought through the details, they haven't thought about who's paying for it, they haven't actually thought about how it works, it only impacts some races, and then at the very bottom of their fact sheet it says, we're trying to fix a regulatory environment that's unsafe for businesses. Colorado's a great place to do business. It is one of the best places creating jobs right now. And so what are we actually trying to fix? What is this initiative being funded for? Why are they funding it through those folks? When you take a look at the folks opposing it, you have a really, really diverse group of people who are very concerned about what the outcomes are gonna have for people who are not made of Netflix money, not made of Walton money, not made of DeVita money. I'm not sure if you called the governor a broken clock or a working clock. I couldn't figure out. The governor and 
I have many disagreements, yeah. Wolves being one of them. Yeah. We are a Big Ten party. We are excited to have that diversity of opinion. That's exactly what we're trying to protect, is diversity of opinion, not a system where only 30%, or I'm sorry, excuse me, where 30% of races have a single party general election, reduces ideological diversity, and make sure that we have a pay to play ballot access system. That's not the Colorado way. Um, okay, so I wanna end kind of like a, a palate cleanser. So we are in an election year, and I wanna ask the uh, uh, clerks at the end, and just um, outside of ranked choice voting, you know, can you just reassure folks in Colorado about the, the way our system works, just briefly say, you know, how good you guys feel, a Republican and a Democrat, talking about um, our systems and, and how good they are. We are so proud of our election model in Colorado. As I said earlier, we have the best election system in the country that balances access and security, and every single year we gather as an elections community and look at how we can keep making it better. There are new innovative things that Colorado continues to lead on. We will be implementing jail-based voting for the first time this year in the state. Um, we now have protections for election officials. We have campuses, college campuses, that are required to have drop boxes and vote centers. So we are always looking to approve, improve our election model, and we have been planning for 2024 since 2020. So we trust our process. We know our process. We are so proud to share our process with you all. Uh, many clerk's offices across the state open up their doors to the public. You know, please email your clerk and ask for a tour and share what you've seen with your community because there is doubt around our elections model right now. We are not immune from that in the state even though we've been on this great system for years now. So, you know, that's what we really want to showcase this year is um, how great our model is. And one thing that we feel is really important is that if you have concerns about our elections, please talk to us. We welcome you in our environment. We want you to come to us because we are the trusted source. We trust our process and we're proud to showcase it. But um, yes, there are significant concerns going on across the state. We have county clerks that are under attack and under siege from their board of county commissioners and from election deniers. Um, these are folks that have, are having their lives threatened, uh, their jobs threatened, um, and they are, they are worn down. Like there is no way to get around that. Um, we talk to clerks every single day um, that just seem to be hanging on by a thread, but they're in it because this work matters and they know that they are the right person for the job and that's what we have to keep reminding them. And this is especially true and heightened in small rural communities. Um, these clerks have been there for sometimes decades and um, it's not right the way that they're getting treated. It's fine to have concerns about your elections and it's fine to ask those questions. What's not fine is to go after the clerk or their family or their staff. It's wrong and we should be rejecting that. Um, but that's what we're dealing with. And after the 2024 election, regardless of how it goes, we know that we're gonna be seeing that all over again, amplified even worse come next year. Hug your local election official. Yeah. Um, okay, well, thank you guys so much. I appreciate the, the vigorous conversation and, and uh, you know, the spirit of SunFest is a for a better Colorado and, and everyone, you know, I, I feel the feel the love for Colorado up here. So thank you guys so much. And thank you uh, for coming. Please give our panelists a round of applause. And go vote. <laughs>